My name's Simon Mudd, I work at Booking.com. Uh, and the talk this afternoon is to talk about automation and usually it goes fine, it does everything that you want, it saves you time, makes things better, it allows you to go to the bar and not and let the automation do things for you, but sometimes it works the other way around and it uh, makes life difficult. So this is basically a an autopsy of uh, a situation that occurred to us which uh, caused us a bit of pain and confusion and, we, and how we figured out what happened, why it happened. And hopefully it's a learning for, well, it's a learning for us and also hopefully a learning for you for the, uh, the combination of things that can happen sometimes. So I guess you've seen uh, this phrase that a tour is human to foul things up requires a computer. Of course, a computer requires a script. So, uh, and we have one of those that did some strange things. I work for Booking.com. Booking.com's uh, was based in Amsterdam uh, since 1996. It's a hotel accommodation and well, a hotel and accommodation site. Uh, we offer a large number of properties worldwide in uh, over 200 countries. We make a large number of room, room nights. We sell a large number of room, room nights every uh, every day, and the website's in over 40 languages. And customer service that if you have to call us uh, also provides that same service in those languages. We have uh, nearly 16,000 staff now working in. 187 offices worldwide, so it's quite, the company's grown quite a lot over the, uh, the few years that I've been uh, working there. It's also part of the Priceline Group, which probably makes uh, is more well known here in the States, which is uh, PCLN on NASDAQ. So Booking.com uses MySQL, uh, and we use it on a large number of servers. Uh, we have several thousand servers, uh, a large number of those boxes replicate, uh, so we have a large number of uh, masters, and we also have quite a varied set of topologies, some replication chains have a few, a few slaves and uh, we have a few that have uh, 100 or more. The talk today is, as I said earlier, basically talk about replication, well to cover replication at booking, the automation issue that we, uh, we bumped into, the chain of events that happened, uh, the analysis of that and obviously the learnings and uh, the things that you can take away from something like this. Hopefully, even with that, to uh, allow you to, well, prevent you bumping into the same sort of thing yourself. So I guess a lot of people have seen a sort of typical description like this. You see you have a master, uh, have some slaves running under it. Uh, maybe you're running more than one data center, so you have an intermediate master somewhere else. Um, and that intermediate master has its own slaves. If you lose a data center, you can still hopefully provide the same service in that second data center, even if your first data center is not working. So that's something which a lot of people use, and uh, in this particular case, well, and we use uh, as well. Uh, this picture is a bit ugly. We use Orchestrator uh, to manage the servers that we're looking at. Uh, this is an example output. Uh, it's been anonymized, but you can see the uh, see the setup here. You see a master, some intermediate masters, and then some uh, uh, some slaves underneath. The blue number is the number of slaves under each of those intermediate masters. So you can see there's about 100 servers here, quite a large chain. Orchestrator, if you take take off the setting there, you can actually see the full setup of all the individual boxes, but obviously it doesn't fit on the screen. Um, and Orchestrator is quite nice because uh, there isn't much other tooling. I think MEM has something, and I think there are a few other tools that show replication setups, but Orchestrator is quite nice if you've got a few boxes and you want to see how they're configured and which one's behind which one. This is a quick way to see that, and it's uh, and it's very convenient. Um, and Orchestrator allows you to move, move servers around, um, which you can do just because you have to do some maintenance or maybe you want to move servers from one place to another. And also it can, it can handle things like it's uh, one of the main reasons that people like it. The visualization is very good. But obviously the thing is if you have a failure, uh, then it's, uh, it's good that uh, you can find some tool that will fix it for you. So Orchestrator can, if this server in the middle there goes, uh, it dies, it knows what to do. It says, oh, those slaves underneath need to be... Uh, to connect to some other intermediate master and, uh, and it will do it for you automatically if you ask it to. Um, it can do that, it requires either GTID or pseudo GTID, so if you're not using GTID yet, which a lot of people don't do, and even if you do use, uh, you can use pseudo GTID, basically it's just an injection of events into the bin log stream which can be recognized for figuring out how to move one box under another server. Um, yeah. Um, 
A course orchestrator can actually uh, fix masters because that would be the main thing that most people are interested in. But obviously, if you do have intermediate masters, fixing those is good as well. But the, the master is the master failure is the typical case that most people uh, initially are interested in. So if this master here fails, uh, we go, oh dear, that's horrible. Um, we want to find orchestrator, we'll look at the service, it'll figure out which one is most up to date. It will be able to uh, promote it to be a master. It will then move the other slaves underneath uh, or the other intermediate uh, masters underneath that and uh, effectively it will allow you to uh, carry on. But one of the things, so it can do that, it can do all, the, do all of that automatically and that's great. But one thing it can't do, or at least it can't be configured to do my environment and your environment and your environment because everyone else, everyone has a, their own environment is different. For whatever reason, we have our own tooling uh, for deploying systems, for building systems, for how we set our servers up. So obviously one of the things it can't do on its own directly is uh, plug into the, uh, to the environment that you're running. Um, what, what Orchestrator does do is it provides some hooks so should a failure occur, it's able to call some scripts to basically before the failure, before it starts to do something or afterwards, or even if it just detects something that looks, doesn't look very good. And uh, it's able to use those scripts to effectively talk to your environment and do the things that you want. They may be things like uh, you may need to change your, your uh, asset database to know that the server's died, that something needs to be done. We use pseudo GTIDs and that requires uh, and also we have heartbeat mechanisms, so we need to configure those. The master injects some events into the bin log stream, which is basically uh, for us to see if there are replication delays and things like that. And so that, that, that adjustment needs to be made when you promote an intermediate uh, master to, or a slave to be a, to be a new master. And obviously that's, that's uh, environment dependent. So uh, the, the things do that there. Um, we also contribute to Orchestrator, so uh, we've been using Orchestrator for I think uh, two or maybe two and a bit, bit more than two years now. Um, it's written by Shlomi Nowak. He uh, was working at Outbrain. He came to work with us and uh, originally set uh, Orchestrator up and he's moved on since to GitHub. He was doing a presentation earlier today, which uh, maybe some of you have been to. Um, but uh, our use of Orchestrator is at scale. We have a large number of servers, and I think because of that, we've had to make some adapt. Uh, we've had to adapt it to cope better with uh, with the load that we uh, and the scale that we have. So we've been providing uh, some patches back to to upstream to him uh, to to help us. Um, and of course, he's he's improving it as well. So uh, so that's going on. And just as a quick um, idea of the, the sort of topologies that you can see when things get a bit more complicated, the earlier one I showed was a bit smaller. This is a larger chain. I'm not showing the number of the servers there, but uh, it's quite a large chain. And you can see there's a large number of intermediate masters. But there are strange things like those things at the bottom right, which we're testing MySQL 8.0 at the moment. So we've added an 8.0 intermediate master, and we've got some slaves behind that. And we can just do that quite easily. And the thing is that when you've got this number of servers, if you don't have a good tool to visualize what's going on, you can get lost about which box is replicating from where, and obviously this is, this is quite nice. So that's the replication environment that we're running in. The particular system that uh, we had the problem on was much smaller. It was a very simple master and slave uh, set up in one data center with a master and sl intermediate master and slave in a second da uh, data center. Our, in our particular case, we talk to the, the applications talk to the master through a DNS entry. Um, and they, and that, that is, we modify that to, to point to the specific master that we, uh, that we need to use. Reads, if we need to do reads, then we read from uh, the appropriate slaves at the bottom layer there. So it may be in one data center from one set of slaves and the other data center from the other set of slaves. So this particular setup was sort of running, doing its usual thing. It had been running for months like this, no problems at all, and we were quite happy. Then all of a sudden, both boxes on the left died. That really wasn't very good at the same time, which is unusual. Usually you just get a single failure and uh, that's okay. But in this particular case, we actually lost both servers at the same time. Um, obviously that's, that's odd. So, but the thing is, um, well, you know, orchestrators came along and said, ah, oh, they're broken. I need to find a master. It knew that the only two remaining boxes were those over there. The one at the top is obviously a uh, the best candidate to be the master, so it promoted it. It uh, pointed the DNS to, so the applications knew to write to X. And 
reads carried on happening from Y, which they've been doing before, but there were a few applications in the other data center because the other application servers were running fine. They were trying to read from B uh, orchestrator at the moment, or our scripting doesn't actually fix that at the moment. So we had to sort of manually adjust that, but that was a small, uh, that was a small change that was quite easy to do. And then basically this has happened over the weekend, so basically, or is at the end of the week, so basically we sort of left that going and said, okay, we'll do a few things. Let's go to bed, we'll have a look at it later. That seems like a good idea. And uh, that was fine. So following morning, wake up, go check what things, what's going on. And oh, that looks weird. The DNS is pointing to B, uh, which has come back and there's X, Y over there. And hmm, that seems strange. And the slaves that are, or the, the applications that are reading for the slaves are reading from a box that's not being written to. That's not helpful at all. Okay, so hmm. Great. So that's basically not very good because, okay, um, well, the, the, the good thing is that when A and B failed, but X was promoted. But obviously, in the meantime, something happened and B got promoted to be a master. And uh, that was obviously not, a bit bad because that happened a bit later after writes had happened on X and Y. So obviously, there have been writes going on uh, to the X and Y when X was a master, and that had been working fine. But something had happened in the meantime and B got uh, promoted. So when we woke up, we basically found out that B was being written to. So we had data in B that wasn't in X and Y, and we had data in X and Y which wasn't in B, which is just the sort of thing that you don't really want to happen, to have happen to you. Um, so yeah, so that was the failure. Okay, so we had this, so we saw, we saw this. Um, the thing is that basically what happened is that after the failure that we saw in A and B, they did come back. Those two boxes, uh, they were, went down temporarily, but they did actually both come back, so that was fine. That seemed, you know, they weren't, nothing was using them. They were sort of there, but uh, so they didn't really seem to affect anything. That seemed great. Uh, and everything else was sort of happening fine with the writes uh, going to the, the, the box on X, reads happening from the box on Y, and that was fine. So the question is, okay, so how do we get to this situation where the B was working, A wasn't working, and what have you? The thing is actually, when you have A and B fail, you've actually got to replace those boxes. You want to get some redundancies, get some uh, the servers running in the, the first data center. So basically you need to rebuild the boxes. So we tend to do this quite often. We often have servers fail occasionally. That's no, that's no big deal. It's something which we don't even think about. We see it fail, we've got a procedure to, let's just reclone this box, let it run. In a while, it'll take a copy of one of the boxes in the active cluster, which in this case would have been X or Y. It would have taken a copy of that, it would have made it a slave, and uh, that would have been fine. Um, but obviously, that, that's not what happened. So the, the thing that happened is that when A failed, when A and B had been running, so Orchestrator saw this, and it obviously didn't do anything originally, but it did eventually decide that when A failed, well, it wasn't very good, and it should actually promote A box to be the new master. And the problem was, and this was a configure, this was a script failure that we had. That our script, that when it gets called by orchestrator, please point the master to so and so. The script basically considered A, B, X, and Y as the same, the same cluster. So it basically looked for where do I need this box is the master now. So okay, I will take and I will point the VIP, the the name to to this box. That obviously shouldn't have happened. That was a mistake. We should have checked that the uh, that the A and B boxes were actually part of the cluster they were supposed to be in, and in this, in this particular case, that, that wasn't the case. So that was a mistake uh, here. But obviously it did run, and that's what triggered that. The question then may be, so why did A fail? Okay, so as I say, we usually do this cloning thing, and we had A and B were sitting there doing their things previously. They, they come back, they were like working and things, and uh, in some situations, if it's just a slave or something, it comes back. Well, it, it would have had data that was a bit old. It would have had data which was in a state previous to what X and Y were, were in. So probably we could have put B under X and Y, and that would have worked, and that wouldn't have required any work at all. That would have been quite simple. Um, but A, a is a master. Uh, a, with our setup, we inject these events into the bin log stream. So uh, once the, uh, the, inter the, the old master came up again, it started injecting values back into the replication stream. B was configured to replicate from A. So the, the content of the database wasn't quite in sync, especially with these, uh, uh, the, the, the replication, well, sorry, sorry, the timestamp events, it wasn't quite the same as the, the other one. 
So, so because of that, we couldn't really clone. Uh, so we basically had to clone the boxes. We could, and usually when we have a failure like this, we could clone both boxes at once, but then we have no, should the other data center fail, then we have no data in the, pre, in the first data center. So we tend to do one box, let that finish, let it do its thing, then do the other one. And with that, uh, you always have a copy of the data, even if you've had an outage such as this, where in theory you've lost a whole data center's worth of, of data. So the thing is that we actually chose in, in this particular case to, uh, to clone the, the intermediate master A. We told uh, orchestrator not really to pay too much attention to A and B, and uh, so we shut down. We shut down A. That we thought that was fine, okay, uh, and we'll clone it. Orchestrator basically ignored uh, A and B. It had had a previous fail a failover, um, and and basically orchestrator's configured so that if it sees a failure a failure of a cluster, it will do a, it will do a recovery. Is then configured not to do it again for some time, because if you do it again, you might get into some sort of cascading failure or something like that. So it's often sensible to pause for a while. And uh, in our particular configuration, usually we have that set to one to one hour. We were doing something over the weekend, so we didn't really see see that. So because of that, when we started to reclone server A, we were in that one hour win window. Consequently, nothing happened. Orchestrate didn't do anything. We didn't see any immediate obvious problem. And uh, when we went away to, to bed and things, that was fine. But of course, that, that period expired. And when that period expired, we'd also down to, the other thing is Orchestrator has a downtime mechanism. So you can say, ignore this server. Don't worry about it. It's, it's under maintenance for a while. Just to leave it, leave it for a while. So there's both a, a mechanism for avoiding re repeated recoveries. And there's also a mechanism for can, uh, avoiding ignoring a server that might not be behaving properly. And we'd basically triggered both of those things to ignore the server A, um, but both those time, uh, those, those things came out. Uh, came, the timeouts expired. And consequently, the orchestrator suddenly, after four hours or something, we said, OK, forget that, don't worry. And it suddenly said, oh, but the, the master's dead. The fact that we were cloning it, it didn't know. Uh, or re re rebuilding the saved it, we didn't know. So it basically said, well, I'm left with B. I will promote it, and obviously called the script in the, uh, as a consequence. I think the summary of what comes from that, therefore, is that uh, it's unusual for us to see several servers in the same replication chain fail at once. Uh, it's not impossible, but obviously in this particular case it happens. Um, we use several timeouts for different things. This particular event was also over a weekend, um, so there weren't as many people paying attention to what was going on. And also, probably over that period, you don't necessarily want to have the same timeouts because you don't have everyone actively looking at the servers that are going on. Um, and again, the, the script didn't quite do the same thing, the, the thing it should have done. Um, and then with our, our mechanism that we usually do when we recover servers which, which have failed, we chose the wrong server, basically, uh, to do first. Or we didn't set the timeouts to be appropriate. And, and consequently, uh, the combination of all of these factors triggered the situation the orchestrator thought it was doing the right thing. And Consequently, uh, and consequently, basically, it, uh, it did the failure behavior, which we didn't really want. So were we just lucky that A and B failed? The thing is that uh, when we had a look later, it turned out that, uh, yes, we were a bit unlucky. But actually, these weren't the only two boxes to fail. I think we had uh, between 10 and 20 servers failed in the same data center. We had some people there doing some work. They uh, happened to be seating some new blades in a chassis or something like that, and uh, pushing a bit too hard or something like that happened to disconnect the, the, the blades adjacent to the ones that were being added. So something really simple you wouldn't expect would happen, but it uh, affected several servers over the course of the day, and the operators doing this weren't aware of, uh, of what they were doing. So that, that, was, that was unusual. And, uh, and usually we don't have this sort of maintenance going on. We, I think we're doing a, a bulk change of some, of some hardware and things. And uh, it just triggered several failures. And it, was, it took us a while to identify what was going on. Um, the other thing that's, I guess, complicated is, uh, as we said, we ended up in a situation where we had data on B, which wasn't on X and Y. And we had data on X and Y, which wasn't on B. Um, and that's usually you want to fix something like that. Had this particular cluster wasn't uh, critical to us. So in the end, we basically 
didn't really worry about what the data that was lost. It was uh, statistical data for, uh, for a system that we were using. Um, but part of the problem came from the fact that we were using auto increments. So a lot of people use uh, auto increments as a primary key for, for data they're adding, and so that's, that's convenient, that's easy, that's fast. And, uh, but of course we had overlapping auto increment values, so really the only way to, to resolve that would have been to look at the, the data, look at the data in the bin logs maybe, and, and, and to fix that. Or to talk to the application developers that uh, knew the type of data was being added, and to figure out what would be required to, to sync up the data and, 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 make it, uh, and make it all correct. We didn't bother to do that. It didn't seem worthwhile in our particular case. And obviously, had, uh, had we needed to, we'd have spent more time doing that. But that, was quite, that would have been type, quite, uh, quite uh, time consuming. Um, I think the sort of takeaway from that is that these sort of situations can happen. They don't happen very often. And uh, the problem is that uh, occasionally they do. You hope that it doesn't it only happens on a, situ on a uh, setup like this, which is quite small. If it happens on a much bigger or more important setup, then obviously that can be a lot more painful. Automation, we had a lot of automation in the system. Or, well, orchestrators designed to automate the recovery of systems. Uh, that's good. It's got lots of safety mechanisms in there, which are designed to prevent the wrong thing happening. And that sort of partly worked, but not quite. The scripting or the hooks used by orchestrator to talk into our own implementation uh, weren't quite uh, hard and uh, weren't quite good enough, and therefore consequently didn't catch an edge case, which really we frankly hadn't expected ever to happen. And then a bit of human interaction, which uh, just mixed in with uh, the combination of these things. We did a couple of things that perhaps might have been done slightly differently in hindsight, but uh, at the time it didn't seem to make much difference. You sort of forget that there's these systems checking everything all the time, and you sort of forget about the default times, the values that you use. And it's the weekend, and you're tired, and what have you, and OK, it's sort of one of those things that happens. So the combination of those things just, just slipped through and, and uh, triggered the, the failure that we saw. Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, that's, that's, that's a shame, but it, it, occasionally it happens. I think the only thing you can try and do is you can try and make scripts that talk to different systems, make them more as complete as possible, but you're never They'll never be complete because something else will happen, even if you know, have we fixed these issues. But if we, something else might come along because our systems are changing and probably your systems are changing too. In six months' time, there'll be other things to take into account and, and we have to remember to adapt for that. Um, the situation with the auto, the auto increment columns, I think there's one option is to have uh, sort of increasing UUID values, which is, uh, which is possible. Also, the other situation, which we actually have an auto ink uh, ID service, which we use on a few systems. We don't use it very heavily. And maybe something like this uh, might have been better because then there wouldn't have been any, any overlaps and it would have been trivial to effectively to pipe in the bin log, the changes from the bin logs from uh, one of the systems into the other one. And that would have probably saved us a lot of time and a lot of pain and probably we wouldn't have lost any days have it had that situation arisen. But uh, in this particular case, that wasn't the case. So maybe for something for, uh, for us is to, uh, is to look at using the auto ink type service uh, more frequently um, to prevent situations like that occurring. As for Orchestrator, I think that basically it basically did what it was supposed to do. I think that uh, the automation that we had configured around and the interaction we had around Orchestrator had unintended side effects. Um, but I don't think it really did the wrong thing. Uh, that may be slightly debatable, but I think uh, I think it pretty much did the right thing. The thing is, it depends exactly what you want. The situations, something like this, what do you want to happen? Uh, it, it really depends. And there's there's been you know I've I've been talking with Shlomi. We've talked about to Shlomi about the situation, and you have to really understand exactly what happened. And then obviously, if you want to modify the code in Orchestrator or the code in the scripts that we're using to behave better, you have to make sure that they actually make sense in, in all cases. Um, in any case, Orchestrator is, being, is, is continuously being changed. We're adding features to it, and as I say, Shlomi is as well. So I think situations like this probably will be handled perhaps better, and maybe Orchestrator will be smarter in the future, and therefore it'll avoid perhaps something like this happening again. There's some links here to, uh, to booking, uh, to the blogs that we have, the technical blogs, some of the things that we do. Also to Orchestrator, uh, there's some um, links to some of my blog sites uh, as well. 
and well, I guess everyone says the same thing, but uh, Booking.com is is hiring. Uh, we're looking for a variety of roles. We're based in Amsterdam, as I said, so maybe that's a long way from here. But if you fancy traveling to Europe, doing something different or or whatever, uh, then let us know. But we have a we do have a small office uh, in Seattle. Uh, uh, so I don't know, but if you're interested or maybe considering coming to do, we've got a lot of different roles, as you can see there, that cover a large variety of uh, different positions. If you're interested, uh, come and uh, get in contact with us or speak to myself, Jean-Francois, who's uh, there, Eric Herman or, or Daniel Van Aden, who's here uh, at the uh, at Bacona Live uh, at the moment. So uh, come and chat to us if, uh, if that might be interesting to you. Any questions? Sorry, pardon? You mentioned testing on a previous slide. Right? That, that, that was really for the, not for orchestrator such, but that's the testing of the, fa testing fa possible failure scenarios. The pro yeah. So one thing is that orchestrator's not perfect either. I mean, it'll show me or kill me for saying so. It's very, very good, but it's, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of edge cases. So I mean, but the testing of, in this particular case of your failure scenarios, you really need to check that you know you're calling hooks that do something in your environment, which makes sense with what you need to do in your in your environment. So I think you really need to kill masters and you know set up a little replication chain that you can kill it and kill it and try and kill it different ways and see what happens. And because there are things like you know you can downtime things, you can you can configure things to there are there are a lot of configuration options in Orchestrator, which frankly can be confusing. It tries to help you, allow you to do whatever you want to do, but obviously in practice, it's hard to know what all these settings do and fully understand that if you don't go and read the code and things. I mean, Shlomi spent, spent a huge amount of time writing documentation for Orchestrator, and I think you know, people have to really recognize that that's a huge effort. Um, but I think for, the, for, failures, for failure scenarios, I think for intermediate masters, there's a lot less to worry about because usually you put the slaves under some other box. It may not be quite right, but um, I didn't show you here. If you've seen any of your orchestrator presentations, that to move boxes about by hand through the GUI is like, you know, anyone can do it. It's easy. So if it does, doesn't quite do what you want, you can rearrange the topology really easily. It's only the master that most people care about. And obviously there they want to the downtime to be as minimal as possible. And obviously those extra things that need to be done to be done as fast as possible. So that's the, the main thing that you just need to test as many scenarios that you can consider and see that it does the, the right thing for those. And, uh, you know, and hope that it, unlike the situation that we happened to catch an edge case which didn't quite fit in our scenarios. Yeah. Uh, you said like orchestrator was improving, but is there anything in particular that's improving? There are some we've we've discussed with this particular environment, for example, that uh, the the setup of the A and B boxes that were like came up afterwards. Uh, it can't. The thing is, there is information which isn't visible there, but the orchestrator allows you to provide information about clusters that I'm part of this cluster, I'm in this DC. There's various like metadata information which it is aware of partly. Um, if it had been aware that those two boxes were in theory part of the XY cluster, then it goes, hang on a second, I shouldn't be failing out because that the master's over, these boxes are, that they shouldn't be part of that thing over there. That's the only thing that I think that potentially would would make us make would make a difference yes i think i mean i think that's the, the the thing is that if you have a downtime then you recognize the system is broken so if that expires and the system's still broken then maybe the downtime setup isn't quite right you know if you actually come if you actually comes out of downtime and the system's working fine oh okay Well, I think part of it's that the, but I think that Orchestrator saw A and B as a, a different as a, yeah. as a different cluster. It was. But independent of that, because yeah. it sounds like that triggers a customization. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, and that's the piece that is, it, you should treat all all four servers as as essentially arbitrary random servers, and at any given point, it needs to be aware of who has what. But this 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 script is like run. Yeah. 
hundreds of times. So yeah, so that's the, that's the thing is that it's one hundreds of times, it was fine hundreds of times, and we just happened to trigger it running wrong, in the wrong situation. And that's because we just didn't consider it, you know. That's configurable. The, config, the configuration setting, we have it set out at the moment is an hour. So basically, you, you prevent failures of the same master and the same replication chain or even intermediate happening more than once an hour. Usually, because if something like that happens, then you're sort of saying, well, hang on a second, you know, maybe it's okay, but if you don't have that, we have seen a couple of times, if you, have a very, if you had no like throttle there, you may see a master failure, it does something, another box fails, it does something, another box fails, is, is that, is orchestrator doing the right thing? Is it not seeing the, is, is, you start to then question, is there a problem? We had a, a different outage which happened uh, over, a, over a year ago and that, that affected a large number of servers and basically we saw like four or five, there were different replication chains failures in a very short period of time. And the problem was then that we couldn't be sure that it was doing the right thing and I basically just shut down orchestrator. Not because it, it was doing the right thing, but you can't assimilate to be sure. You suddenly go, I expect to see a failure infrequently. I mean, master failures, you don't expect to see those a lot. If you have a lot of servers, okay, you say, see them more frequently. But I saw one, and then another, and then another, and another, and by then you just want to shut it down. And you, then you'll have a look and say, okay, it's fine, turn it on again. But uh, until you're sure of it, that you can lose a lot of confidence in a bit of software that could be going mad and doing the wrong thing. Uh, no, because usually it doesn't make, it was a combination of two factors and I'll say I think a little bit of human interaction which was perhaps, uh, which triggered things uh, being incorrect. I think potentially it might be nice to adjust the schedule over different parts of the day. So weekends might be treated differently to work periods, but that's not something which is a, I mean we could, you can change the configuration dynamically in Orchestrator so we could make Puppet or whatever or some other system modify those settings you know, during different parts of the day. But uh, I think it's overkill, probably. You just need to be aware, you need to be aware of this and obviously, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, that you understand how your systems work. For our what, sorry? We have thousands of servers being managed by orchestrator, yes. We're using it for everything. I can't show you ever, there's a orchestrator page which gives you a list of clusters, which is like a replication chain, and our clusters don't fit on one page. So all the, all the ones we have don't fit on one, on, on, my, on my screen, they don't fit on one page. So we have a, we have a large number of, and we're using it all the time, yeah, because uh, we rely on it because we used to get called at two in the morning and three in the morning, something broke, and you'd be there and you'd be stressed and people are saying, fix it quickly because, you know, we're not taking reservations and, and life would be quite horrible. And that was what it was like before we, you know, we started using Orchestrator. And to be honest, I mean, nowadays you come in, you see a few emails, a few things are broken. Uh, we also have it set up so that uh, you have to acknowledge a, fa uh, a failure to allow it to continue, which, which, is, which is a good thing too, because it means that uh, there's a bit of human interaction there to prevent like cascading type failures. And yeah, we, we I mean, I'm saying it's not perfect, but uh, don't misunderstand, we're using it to manage several thousand servers, and uh, don't ask me to turn this off. Thank you very much.